Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Get everyone to stand with me as we get into our song service this morning. 212 in the hymnal, I love you, Lord. We'll sing through this choir. Lift your hearts and the voices to the Lord this morning. Brother Mark, would you please voice a prayer over our service this morning? look around find someone you ain't got to speak to yet this morning let's shake some hands hug some necks make everyone feel welcome this morning
excited to be here to worship Christ and to study his word. Let it be known by saying hallelujah. hallelujah. Wow, that works so much better than saying good morning. Good job. Hey, if you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. We're glad you've chosen to be a, a part of us this morning. Uh, we d Not really a visitor, but we're thankful to have Mitchell Crawford back with us from Baghdad and uh, welcome him home. It's good to have him. I'm sure mom and dad, they're kind of like, eh, we don't really care. See, look, they're not excited. You see them. I uh, want to bring your attention to some announcements that we have here. Uh, Ladies Fellowship will be May 3rd at 6 p.m. in the Life Center. Uh, that's this Tuesday. Uh, Rexanne Tribble of All About Flowers in town is going to be here to speak, and she's going to be talking about The Call, which is a uh, sort of a ministry organization that deals with foster uh, children and, and all that. So please come, ladies, and be a part of that as she shares uh, her heart and, and about that ministry in that organization, uh, May 3rd, 6 p.m. in the Life Center. Uh, also, just a reminder that Wednesday, May 18th is the last Gospel Seekers, uh, and then we'll break for the summer and then pick up again uh, in the fall when school starts. And then VBS is on June 26 through 30. We're still needing some uh, supplies. There's a box back there if you want to donate some supplies for that. Uh, for crafts, we'd really appreciate that, and that would be a blessing uh, to those who are going to be doing it as well as the children uh, who will be coming. Uh, one other thing, usually next Sunday is the second Sunday of the month and we have business meeting, but because next Sunday is Mother's Day, we're going to reschedule that, so business meeting will be the third Sunday of the month, which I believe is the 15th, uh, so keep that in mind. And then tonight, uh, I want to welcome you back as we have our first fruits of prayer time as we pray together uh, as a congregation and go before the Lord in that. So anything else uh, this morning, anybody knows of? Anybody celebrate a birthday this past week? <coughs> Any birthdays? No? <coughs> what about anniversary? No birthdays, no anniversary. Let's get back into our song service this morning. 334 in the hymnal. Y'all stand with me as we sing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Sing all three verses with me, Jerry. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine, oh what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. my Savior all the day long, perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight, angels descending bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is 
next song this morning will be our uh, offertory and it's uh, Jesus Lord to me is that one not in your hand
you pray with me this morning? Father, as we come before you now, and, and Lord, as we break the bread of your word, as we open it up, God, and discover, Lord, just the rich truths and the, the valuable treasures that we find there, God, I, I pray that, Lord, today we could be encouraged by these truths, Lord, that we could be challenged by them today, I pray. God, most importantly, I pray that we would walk out of this place desiring and with a passion to live by them and live and for you and through the power of your spirit, I pray. Father, I, I pray that, God, that you would be glorified uh, through your truth in this place today, God, that it would not be my words, but it would just come directly from the scriptures, God, and that you would, by the power of your spirit, would open up these truths to us, give us understanding and, and wisdom and insight, God, I pray. Lord, we, we pray all these things, and we ask that you be glorified through the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Nehemiah uh, this morning. Uh, th the last two weeks, we've been going through uh, what it means to suffer well and, and what that looks like and biblically uh, why we do that and, and what it accomplishes in our lives, not just our lives, but to the glory of God. And, and so today we're going to move from that, but we're going to be in a, in a similar neighborhood as we're going to look at how to handle discouragement or adversity. And so uh, that, that kind of plays along these lines. And we're going to see uh, from the prophet Nehemiah things that the, the children of Israel were encountering that brought discouragement and adversity to them and how he as a leader handled those things. And what we can glean from that. But before we get to the focal passage of that, we have to do a little work. We have to go back and examine what's going on at the time of, of these events and what's occurring. And so when you open the book of Nehemiah, you find in chapter 1 that he is in exile. That he is, in fact, in Susa, which is the capital city of Persia. He is under the care and the rule of King Xerxes. And so what's happened is the children of Israel have been exiled from their homeland. They've been kicked out of the promised land. They, Jerusalem has been destroyed, and now they're in captivity. They're in exile, and, and Nehemiah, as the prophet of God, is here in Susa, and, and he's, he's just under this rule of a, of a pagan nation and a pagan king, and, and he gets word from his brother and some other people from Judah about what's going on in Jerusalem. He, he gets word as to what's happened to the holy city of God, and, and we pick this up in, in, in verse 3. As they're speaking to him and they're, they're, sh they're saying what's going on at the end of verse 3, it says, The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. And so when we open up Nehemiah, we see that the beginning is one of calamity, that he is in fact in exile. He's under the rule of King Xerxes and, and he is now learning that the Holy Land, the, the promised city of God where God people dwelled and where they called home, Jerusalem, has been destroyed. The walls have been broken down and the gates are destroyed by fire. And, and the picture that this causes is, is that the reality is that the city has been left in ruin. Uh, since the, the walls are broken down, there's nothing there to protect the city. And so the, the buildings inside the walls have, in fact, been sacked and, and ruined as well. And so the whole city is a, a heap. It's a mess. And, and we'll have a picture in a moment. I'm going to have Jerry put it up. Not yet. But of what that would have looked like during the time of Nehemiah's life, what Jerusalem would have looked like. And we'll get to that in just a moment. So he's received this word that the walls of Jerusalem have fallen, that it's in ruin, that the gates that, that guard the city, that they're burned up by fire. And look at what verse 4 says. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days. Now, we could see that and say, okay, he's weeping and mourning over the reality that the walls are destroyed and in ruin and the gates are burned up by fire. And that may be part of it, but there's something that's underlying this. There's something that's in his heart that he recognizes as to the reason why this is the case. The reason that the city is in such turmoil and ruin. So as, at this recognition, he is mourning, he's weeping, he's broken over this, and he begins to pray to God. Look at verse 6. At the end of verse 6, he's praying to God, and he, it says there that he's confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house has, has sinned. 
We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. So that's the reality as to why Nehemiah is prostrate before God and he is crying and weeping and mourning over what has occurred to Jerusalem. The reality of it is, is because they have disobeyed God, they've rebelled against God, they have sinned against God, and they have turned from his rules and his statutes and his commands, God has brought judgment upon his people. You see this when you study the Old Testament that God, and we talked a little bit about it in Sunday school this morning, that when God says that if you follow me, if you're obedient to me, you're going to have all these blessings, and this is going to be true of you. But if you disobey me and you turn from me and you don't return to me, then the consequence of this is going to be my wrath, my anger, and my judgment. And he would execute that by raising up a wicked king and a pagan nation to come in and destroy Jerusalem, thus kicking the people out of the promised land, taking them back into captivity, into exile. And that is what has occurred. That is why Nehemiah, when he gets word of this, he is weeping and he's mourning. He's weeping and mourning over the sin of the nation, over the sin of the people. He recognizes that this is why Jerusalem is in ruin. It's because they've turned from God. Look at verse 8. He's, again, he's praying to God, and he says to God, Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the people. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of the heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them into the place that I have chosen for them to make my name dwell there. So he's reminding God of his promise. He's reminding God that God is a faithful God and that because he's promised this, if in fact the people repent and they return to God and they follow God and are obedient to God, that he will draw them out of all the countries that they've been exiled to back to the homeland, back to the land that he had given them as an inheritance. And so he's praying this and he's reminding God of his promise. And so this is sort of what's transpiring here when we get to handling uh, discouragement and adversity. This is what's gone in the nation and the history of Israel. They've rebelled against God. They've broken God's covenant, and they've been punished. They've suffered God's judgment for this because of their sin and their wickedness and the fact that they have rebelled against God. Nehemiah is weeping and mourning over the sin of the nation. He's praying to God and saying, if we repent and if we return, please remember your promise that you will restore us. Then in chapter 2, he goes before the king, and he, he pleads with the king. He says, if I found favor in your sight, will you please let me go back so that I can rebuild the walls of my, my homeland, rebuild the walls of the city that, that is my home, that's my place of worship, that's where my God dwells. If I could go do that, and then he asks the king, if you allow me to do this, can we also stop by where you have some supplies and pick up some supplies to do this? And so he's He's pretty bold with this. He's standing before a wicked king, but he's pleading on behalf of his nation and his people and his God to say, if I found favor in your sight, please let me go rebuild it and let me have some supplies to rebuild it. And look at what it says at the end of verse 8 in chapter 2. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Why did the king grant to Nehemiah what he asked because God's hand was upon him. God was purposing this. God was calling this and placing this in the heart of Nehemiah that he go back and rebuild the walls. And so he gives favor to Nehemiah with this king, King Xerxes, and it says that the king grants him what he asked for, grants him permission to go and to rebuild and grants him permission. He gives them letters to take to these people so that they can get some material and some supplies. And then look at what it says in verse 12, we see further evidence that, that God's the one that's in control of this. God's the one that's purposing this. Verse 12, at the end of verse 12, it says, I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. God was the one that had placed this burden, this charge, this uh, responsibility in the heart of Nehemiah. He had caused and birthed within Nehemiah a desire to go and rebuild the walls. That was God's plan and his purpose, and he was going to use Nehemiah to do so. God wanted the walls restored. He wanted the city restored because he had heard the repentant prayer of Nehemiah and was going to be faithful to return them if they repented and they came back to God. So that's what's occurring at the time of where we're going to pick up this story. Nehemiah has prayed before God. He's repented. He's confessed the sins of the nation. 
and he's prayed that God remains faithful to his promises. He's wept and mourned over the sin of the nation, and he's found favor in the sight of the king so that he can go and rebuild the wall and have some material and supplies to do this. Look at verse 17 of chapter 2. He's, he's talking to some people after he's gone. He's gone back to Jerusalem. He's examined the walls. He's examined the gates. And in verse 17, it says this. Then I said to them, you see, we are in trouble. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Jerry, I want you to put up that picture uh, that I gave you. He's gone and he's examined the walls. This, this picture here is just a, a rough estimation of what Jerusalem would have looked like during the time of Nehemiah before it was destroyed. And as you can see here, the city is within the walls. The walls are very great and there's several gates throughout this. And then you have the Temple Mount and the Temple there. And the picture of this is that this was a well-fortified city, yet... Because of judgment, because of their sin and rebellion, God had brought a nation to this place and had wiped out those walls. They are no longer standing. They are in piles of rubble, piles of ruin. The gates are burned up. People can come and go as they please. Now, looking at this picture, it looks rather small in nature, but you can imagine how big and how vast this would have been. So I want you to picture that city, that fortified city, all the walls destroyed in rubble and piles of stone and all the gates burned up. Is that a monumental task? Anyone, answer it. Yes, pretty big task that he's birthed in Nehemiah's heart. I want you to go back, Nehemiah, and I want you to rebuild these walls. I want you to restore it, to fortify it, to rebuild the gates, to make it where it once was. A tremendous task, a huge undertaking. And he only had a handful of people to do it and a little bit of supplies that the king had given him. Now... With this big task in mind, would you be encouraged to undertake it? It's okay. You can participate. This is your time to answer. Would you be encouraged to undertake it? No. Why? Too big. Too hard. I, I don't want to work that long and that hard, but look at what it says there. He says, we've been made laughing stocks of the nations. We have suffered derision because our walls are down. That's verse 17. And then he says to them, here's what God has done. Not only have I been released from my captivity to come here and to undertake this task, but the king has given me letters so that we can go get some supplies. God's hand has been upon it. He's placed this in my heart. And the people said, let us rise up and build. And so they strengthened their hands for the good work. What made it good work? Because God wanted it done. You know, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, the apostle Paul said, do not grow weary in doing good. When we're working for the Lord, when we're serving him, when we're doing what he's asked us to do, listen to me, even if it's monumental, even if it's too big, even if it's something like this and we think it can't be done by us, he says, I'm going to strengthen you, I'm going to empower you to do it, and if you surrender to me, it will get done. Because I have purposed it, I've called it, and I've caused it to be so the people initially, they see this task. They don't respond as we just did and say, no, I don't feel encouraged to do it. They are encouraged. They said, let's rise up. Let's build this. Let's do this because God is in this. They recognize the hand of God in Nehemiah's life and what he had had to get through to even get back to them. And they saw this and they strengthened their hands. They made themselves ready. They were encouraged and excited for the good work, for the restoration, the the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem so that they would have the holy place of God again. They could have their home again and that they would return because that was the promise of God. If we obey God, what has God called them to do? Rebuild the walls. So if we obey that, God is going to gather us back from wherever we've been scattered from and restore us. That's his promise and he is faithful to do it. This is the good work that he's speaking of. And then chapter 3, we have where we see the, the, the different families laid out to go to certain gates and rebuild and go to certain parts of the wall and rebuild. And, and we're not going to go through all that. You can read that if you would like. I encourage you to do so. How they begin to rebuild the wall and the work is going on. But then we get to chapter 4. And this is where 
the focus of the message is going to be. How to handle discouragement and adversity. <coughs> Chapter 4, my Bible has these little sub-text headings, and mine says opposition to the word. And so when you face opposition, when you face discouragement, when you face dis- uh, adversity, how are we as the people of God going to handle this, and what can we glean from how Nehemiah addressed it and understand what God's word is saying to us today? Uh, verse 1 of chapter 4 says this. Now when Sambalot heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and the army of Samaria, and then he goes on to say a few things. We see this person, Sambalot, and all we really know of him is that he is an adversary to the Jews. He was a Samaritan. Anybody remember the history between Jews and Samaritans? Did they get along? Did they like each other? Were they friendly? No, they were enemies. They, were, they hated one another, and this man was an enemy of, of the children of Israel, of the people of God. He did not like them, and when he saw that they were rebuilding the wall, his response was one of anger and malice. He didn't want it to happen. Why? What happens if the walls are rebuilt? The Jews return. Why? Because they're obedient to what God has called, and he brings them to there. What happens if the Jews return to Jerusalem? They are back in the city. They take hold of it. They lay hold of it because God has given it to them to be stewards of. And then the people of God have returned. They're hated enemies, the Samaritans. They don't want this to happen. And so he's going to stand in opposition. But I want to get to the focal passage. So let's look at uh, verse 10 of chapter 4. We'll begin there and we'll break this down. They have this great task. We've seen the picture. We've seen how massive the city was, how big the walls were, and how big a task that would be that God has caused them to go about doing. But if they want to return, God said, if you return to me and you are obedient to what I've commanded you to do, I will gather you together. I will bring you back and restore you. So they have to complete it because God has birthed it in Nehemiah's heart. He's given it to them to do. At first they were excited as we saw, but listen to what verse 10 says. In Judah, that's that's the tribe of Judah, that's where Jerusalem is, the, the nation of Israel. In Judah it was said, The strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. So the first uh, point of discouragement, the first point of opposition, the first point of adversity is within. Within the people who are doing this task, there is discouragement and adversity building. What is that? The strength of those who are doing the work is failing. The rubble is too Great, and they begin to say, we cannot do this. Do do you see that this morning, church? The discouragement started from within the congregation, within the people who were doing the work. Now, how does that apply to us? Has God not called us to do something monumental and greater than any of us can do? Right? I mean, he has. That's not a rhetorical question. You can say yes or no, but he has. He's called us to do what? We talked about it after the resurrection, to go into all the world and preach the gospel and to Make disciples of all men and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them all that I've commanded you. That is a monumental task. Have you seen how big our world is, church? Do you know how vast it is? Let's just look at Union County. Just us in this building. Could we reach Union County just by ourselves? No, it would be hard. There's a lot of people. It's a huge task. So when we're doing this and our strength fails and we get discouraged and we feel like, oh, there's too many people to reach, we can't do this by ourselves, what do we want to do? We want to throw in the towel. We want to give up. That's where these people were, within the congregation, within the people who were commissioned and commanded to do this work, they were getting tired and discouraged and facing adversity. They wanted to throw in the towel. They wanted to give up and to give in. It was too big. Look at what it says. We're, we're getting tired. It's too much rubble. That's what we confessed at the beginning of this when I showed you the picture. It's too great a task. But you know, the scripture says that greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. The, the spirit of the living God that dwells in us empowers us to do what is impossible. Do you understand that, church? Do you, do you recognize that from scripture today, that God's spirit in you gives you and I the power to do the impossible. Now, I know you're asleep and you're not quite with me, but that should elicit an amen. Anybody? Anybody excited that God's spirit in you 
gives you the power to fulfill what he's commanded you to do. Amen, church? That's the reality and the truth of God's word. It's no longer it's too big or it's too impossible. In our own strength, sure, that's right. But we don't live on our own strength. We live in the power of God. When the Spirit has come upon you, Acts 1-8 says, you will receive what? Power. That power in us enables us to do what looks impossible to our eyes. But in order to have that be reality, what we're seeing has to be changed. Our perspective has to alter a bit, and we'll get to that in a moment when we look at Nehemiah's keys to success. The next thing, the next point of discouragement or adversity is found in, in verse 11. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come on them and kill them and stop the work. That's Sandalot and his crew, the enemies who are coming against the Jews. So the discouragement of the adversity also happens outside, outside the congregation, the enemies of this group of people. They will not know or see the time in which we come with the sword and we kill them and we stop the work. Friends, we're, we're seeing this all over the country, not our country, but all over the world where the cause of Christ is being persecuted with the sword and with death. We don't experience here in our nation yet, but all over the world, Christians are suffering that kind of fear and that kind of persecution. As they're going out into all the world and preaching the gospel, as they're standing firm on the word of Christ and sharing that with others, their enemy is out there saying, we're going to kill you and we're going to stop your work. Now, that can be discouraging, and that kind of adversity can cause us to stop. Let me ask you this. If you were threatened, you share Christ now, I will kill you. Would you still do it? Would you still stand firm on the word of God? Would you stand firm, confirmed in your faith, knowing that death is not the end, and continue to share Christ if it costs you your life? Think about that. Be honest with yourself. Would you do it? If someone had a gun to your head and he said, you share the name of Jesus, I'm pulling this trigger. Would you have the faith to say yes and amen? I'm going to do what God has commanded me to do because his spirit lives in me. and He's empowered me to do so. The other reality of that would be that we would answer in the same way that the Apostle Paul did. To live, I live for Christ. And if I die for Christ, it's gain. That should be the battle cry of the Christian. But the enemy outside, the enemy without the walls, outside of the walls, doesn't want this to occur. We, we talk about this in suffering well. We have an enemy. We have an, adverse, uh, an adversary, don't we, church? What's his name? Satan. Satan. And he, what is he doing? Looking for whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. John chapter 10, seeking whom he can steal, kill, and destroy. That is what he's all about. And he's out there, and he's gunning for us, he doesn't want the work done. Do you think the devil wants the spread of the gospel? But that's our command, that's our commission, that's the work, the good work that Jesus has given us, the church, to do. And the enemy's out there saying, if you do it, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to stop the work. And that could lead to great discouragement for us. Let's look on the next uh, form or, or place that we find discouragement in adversity uh, found in, in chapter 12. I mean, verse 12, sorry. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came in all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. So now from their own countrymen, those not in the congregation, those not there doing the work with them, but those who were their family members, their friends, their neighbors, their loved ones, coming and saying, it's too dangerous. Please don't go and do that. Please don't remain there and fulfill this work. It's too volatile it's too dangerous you cannot do that please come back and be here where it's safe with us if they do that does the work continue on no if they abandon what god has commanded them for the sake of their own security and safety and comfort which is what their people their loved one their families are desiring for them to do the work doesn't continue again this work is to rebuild the wall that's what god had called them to do what he's called us to do is to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Does he say only where it's safe? No. Does he say only where you might be comfortable? No. 
Does it say only when you will have security? No, but what he does say is that when you go, even in the harm's way, even in the lion's den, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You are not going alone, dear believer. The, the people that were their own family, their own friends, their own loved ones, sought to discourage them and stop the work. There was adversity there. It's too dangerous. You can't do this. Please, please stop. Ten times it says that they pleaded with them. So on the ninth time that they said, no, we're going to finish the work, they came once more ten times. Please return to us. It's too dangerous for you. Three different places of discouragement and adversity. Three different forms in which that can manifest itself within the congregation. So for us, church, we might have people within our midst that will seek to discourage us from doing what God has called us and commanded us to do. Then we might have the enemy, and we don't might have. We will have the enemy out there seeking to stop the work by causing fear and saying, I'm going to kill you. Are we going to stand for the truth and what God has commanded, or are we going to give in to our fear and seek to save our own lives? The scripture says the one who seeks to save his own life will do what? Lose it. But the one who loses his life for my name will find life. Because life is not in this time and frame with the air in our lungs. True life, eternal life, is with Christ Jesus. So we have three forms or three areas in which discouragement and adversity can come. But we also have three ways in which Nehemiah addresses these things. Three keys to success in order to keep the people focused and moving forward at the task at hand. And this is what we need to see and what we will glean from this. Look at verse 14. This is Nehemiah speaking. He says, And I looked and I arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people. So to the nobles, to the officials, and the rest of the people, all the congregation that's there doing this work, been about this business, the ones who said, yes, let's rise up and build it, and they strengthened their hands for the good work. Now they've become tired, and they've seen that the work is too great, and they feel like they can't do it on their own, and they are faltering because of that. They've also seen that the enemy desires to stop it, and they could lose their life if they continue in this, and their family is saying it's too dangerous, come home. That's what they're facing. So Nehemiah addresses them. He says to this people, look what he says, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Do not be afraid of what's going on around us, the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Remember the Lord. He seeks to change their perspective. Take your eyes off the circumstances. Take your eyes off of all the rubble. Take your eyes off the enemy and what he seeks to do to you. Place your eyes on the Lord, the rock, the foundation, the stronghold, the refuge. He draws their attention back to the one in whom their attention needs to be. We see an example of this in the New Testament. Jesus walking out on the water and, and Peter says, hey, Lord, if that's really you, call to me and I will come. He had faith. He knew that he could do the impossible if Jesus was calling him and commanding him to do it. So Jesus says, all right, come. Of all the disciples, Peter's the only one that stepped out of the boat. The scripture says there that he walked on water for a little bit until when? He started looking at the circumstances. He saw the waves. He saw the wind. What happened? He took his eyes off of Christ, and he put them on the things around him. And what happens then is instead of walking on water, instead of doing the impossible, instead of being obedient to what God had just called him to do, come to me, he sank. The same picture is here. Nehemiah says, take your eyes off the enemy. Take your eyes off the rubble and the great massive amount of work that we have to do. Remember the Lord. They needed a perspective change. They needed a focus shift. In the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Looking to Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter or finisher or founder of our faith. If we're going to do this monumental task that he has commanded the church to be about, we cannot look at our circumstances. We cannot look at the things that we find that are too great or too much of an obstacle or even become entranced by fear of the enemy that's seeking to devour us. We have to keep our focus and our perspective firmly on the Lord. So he calls their attention to that. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. 
Is there anybody more powerful than God? No. Is there anyone more great or awesome than God? No. So why do we sin? You know, the scripture says, if God is for me, who can be against me? Whom shall I fear? Do not be afraid of them, Nehemiah says. Remember the Lord. He changes their focus and their attitude and directs it onto God. Then he says, also remember this, that you fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your home. He brought their attention to who they're doing the work for. They were doing it so that their families, so that their people could be restored unto the Holy Land, where God's temple was, where God would dwell, the promised land that God had given them. Why do we go out and share the gospel? So that God can draw people to himself. He can bring people in that don't know him, return them to his presence. They've been exiled. That's what sin does. It separates us from God. And when we share the gospel and they come to faith in Christ, they are brought back home. We have to remember why we're doing what we're doing. Not just that we focus on God, not just that we're being obedient. That is crucial. That's the number one thing that even Nehemiah addresses. But we also do it because there are people out there who are in exile. They are separated from God and they need to be brought back home in Christ. Look at the next thing. So that was he, he addresses those within the congregation there. Verse 15, he's going to address the enemies. When our enemies heard that it was known to us that our God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. He reminded them that this great and powerful God in whom they were serving, in whom they were being obedient to, in whom they were doing this work for to begin with, when the enemy says, we're going to steal you and kill you and destroy you, when the enemy says, you're not going to know it or see it, and we're going to come and we're going to stop the work. God says, this is my work, and you're not stopping anything. The scripture says that the plans of man are many, but it's the, the plans or the thoughts or the desires of God that will stand the test of time, that will not be thwarted, that will last forever. Verse 15 says, the enemies heard that it was known to them, and that God, who frustrated their plans? God did, because it was his plan to make the wall rebuilt. When the enemy comes against the church and seeks to stop the work of the spread of the gospel by killing people or by enslaving them to prison or whatever the means he might try to do that or crippling them by fear, it's God that frustrates that plan. How does he do that? He strengthens us with his Holy Spirit. He boldens us with the power of his spirit, and we become so on fire for him that we don't care if we're going to lose our life. We respond as Paul did. To live is Christ. To die is my gain. I get to be with him forever. God frustrates the plans. And so instead of being discouraged, what does it say? They return to the wall and each to their work. Even in the midst of this kind of persecution, in the midst of this threat, they knew that God was on their side and they were going to be faithful to complete the work that he had given them. So that's the enemy. Then the, the family, the, the relatives, those who were friends and neighbors that were close to them that said, please leave, it's too dangerous, come and return back to us. Verse 19 and 20 addresses this. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and the rest of the people, the work is great and widespread and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place that you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us here, our God will fight for us. Instead of being divided, instead of being separated because we're afraid or because we're far off from one another or because there's different dangerous situations. Nehemiah said, I know we're separated, I know we're far off, I know that we're spread out and we're vulnerable. But when you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally together. This is the picture of the church, this is the picture of community. Friends, we cannot do this on our own. In fact, the scripture says, do not forsake yourselves to the gathering of the brethren. Why? Because we need one another. We've not been established to just do our own thing and go our own separate ways. God established the church for community, for koinonia, that we can strengthen one another. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says that God has given certain leaders, apostles, evangelists, teachers, preachers, shepherds, all of these things to equip the saints for the work of ministry so that we can all be grown up together in the full stature of Christ as each one gives what they have, as each one joint supplies what it has for the body. 
We all need one another. And Nehemiah says, come together. Do the work together. Be unified together. When you hear the trumpet sound, rally together. Friends, instead of being divided by all these different weird things that we get divided about, let us be united in Christ for the spread of the gospel. Amen? Let us unite together one another, knowing that no one can do it alone. I, as your pastor, I cannot reach this community and this state and this nation and this world by myself. I need you all, and you need me, and we all need each other. Let's rally together for the cause of Christ. When discouragement comes, when adversity rears its head, and it's going to, we've been promised that. We rally together. We recognize that death is not the end and that our God is going to fight for us, and he will thwart the plans because his will and his purpose will be fulfilled. And we understand that we take our focus back to Christ. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. When things around us are going haywire, when the world seeks to come against the church, and, and we have that in our country, we have where our culture is so against Christianity and so against the things of God, and everything is swaying towards the things of Satan and the flesh. And they call us names, and they want to put us down, and that's just verbal persecution, but that's going to lead to other things. When all of that is going on around us, we focus on Jesus we rally together, and we know that God has a plan and a purpose because he's already caused it to come about. He has said, I'm sending you out as doves against the wolves, but fear not them. The scripture says, don't fear what man can do to the body. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both the body and soul. We are either going to be obedient to the word of God and remain in his blessing." Or we're going to be disobedient to God's word and what he's called us to do. And we're going to suffer his wrath and his judgment. There is no middle ground, church. Those are the only two options that we have. Where are you going to be? Will you join me in being obedient to God's call and fulfilling the great commission and the gospel ministry? I pray your answer is yes this morning. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we surrender to be obedient to you and as we launch out, Lord, in the Great Commission, Lord, I know and understand that there's going to be opposition to that. There's going to be the enemy is going to rear his ugly head. He's going to seek to kill us and stop the work. And, and we're going to have people even within this congregation that's going to desire that the, that the work is going to be too great and they don't want to be involved and they're going to try to keep us from moving forward. And God, there's going to be those outside of this that's family or friends or loved ones or neighbors that are going to say, man, it's too dangerous to go there and do that. Please stay here with us. Remain with us where it's safe and secure. But, Lord, that safety and security is an illusion. Because in disobedience, we are not safe and secure from your wrath and your judgment of our disobedience. So even if it should cost us our lives, God, that we would be obedient and faithful to do what it is you've commanded us to do. Knowing that we don't do it in our own strength, but you have empowered us to do the impossible by the power of your spirit. We have no excuse. We cannot look and say the work is too great. Because we serve a great and awesome God. Greater and bigger and better than anything that this world can throw at us. Lord, I pray that as, as we come across this kind of discouragement and this kind of adversity, that we would look to the truth of your word and understand these realities and that we would be encouraged by it, that we would be emboldened by it, Lord, that we would be strengthened by it for the good work, that we would not grow weary in doing good, for we know that at the proper time there will be a harvest of souls reaped if we do not give up. That is the promise of your word in Galatians 6. Lord, that our faith would be founded on the bedrock of Christ and it not be shaken by our circumstances, by the enemy, or anything else that might be thrown our way. That we could suffer well and that we could respond to discouragement and adversity in the manner in which we've learned today. We ask all these things in the beautiful name of Christ. Amen.